My name's Nathan Lisko. Um, this is my Twitter alias and my IRC tag. Uh, please note it down because I forgot to put it at the end. So, yeah, please get in, in touch and give me feedback after. This is a, a presentation, but it's all part of the discussion, and I just hope to sort of add my voice to to this interesting uh, topic. So I've been working with Drupal since early 2008, and this is my fourth DrupalCon, and I'm a seasoned DrupalCon presenter. Um, I'm passionate about delivering quality applications that meet real business needs. So the last time I was in Prague was for my honeymoon in December 2006. <laughs> and I fell in love with this beautiful city and I knew that I'd return one day, but I didn't know that this would be the circumstance of my return. And um, well, Drupal hadn't arrived yet in my life. Um, that came along in Drupal 2000, uh, in, in the year 2008. And, eight, and it was a former colleague of mine, Matt Fielding, who suggested that we might use Drupal to meet the requirements of a project that had a quite a unique feature set um, that we'd never delivered before. Um, and the decision to use Drupal or any framework or CMS is often prompted by a need to deliver a bunch of features that we've not had to deliver before. And it's not that we're not... Um, it's not that we're not willing to venture into the unknown. We've all done that before. Um, I mean, I've been doing web development for 14 years, so you can be sure I've, I've, I've ventured into new ground, whether, for me at least, you know. So it's that we acknowledge that the fact that someone has covered that ground before might actually benefit us, and it might actually produce a higher quality of product. <coughs> So the code and features that we use in Drupal core and much of Contrib uh, are far more robust than the code or features that we could hope to create alone. And the fact that this code is tested in the community and essentially in production across many sites is what, it's part of the reason why we can get excited about the, the Drupal project and it's what distinguishes it from some other projects. Some of us may feel that we can't deliver much without Drupal, but it can be done. We use Drupal because it has a large and flexi flexible feature set, and the way in which the code is distributed and maintained means that our site's features are being tested, fixed, and improved to a greater extent than, than our own use, whether in development, testing, or production, could ever yield. Testing is an important aspect of what makes Drupal a great platform to work with. This is a strong selling point for our clients. They understand this, and that's the reason why many of them are attracted to Drupal. For the next period, we have the opportunity to look at BHAT and how it can help us to, do, to deliver quality. Um, in this room, we have represented um, various levels of experience, I'd imagine, with a, a variety of areas of expertise. But we all have something in common, and it's Drupal that brings us to this conference today. But I'm not going to focus so much upon Drupal because this is a tool that can apply whatever platform you use. Um, but we have that commonality of um, all being involved in the development of web applications. Not only do we have many diverse disciplines represented here, which should be the case in the DevOps track. And um, I, I don't know about you, but the first time I, co I come across the word DevOps, it was, it, it was almost like the first time I came across the word emo. I just had no, no idea what that meant. <laughs> and please explain it to me. Um, and you kind of like look to point the finger and think, is he the DevOps guy? Is he the DevOps guy? And then as you learn about it more, it's, it's rather than it being the role of an individual, it's, it's a, a principle that needs to be shared amongst all men, members of the team. We gather some requirements, we de develop some designs, and maybe we, we build some interactive prototypes, and then perhaps we begin development, um, these are, of course, loose definitions of far more involved processes, but um, we, it's not uncommon for us to sort of check over our work and make sure that it's working at least how we expect. And then when we believe that we've, met, uh, we've reached the point that we've met our obligation to the client, we then show the client, and if the client likes what they see, then we'll push it to live or um, we'll go into the next phase of development. Each piece of this process might be uh, handled by a, dis a, a distinct member of the team. We all, we're all good at what we do in this room, right? 
So when things go wrong, and invariably they do, <coughs> who do we blame for this failure? Maybe, uh, the well, the client's expectations, they see the, the site and they say, it doesn't quite work as we anticipated. So <coughs> who's at fault? Did the client not explain their requirements well enough? Maybe they didn't even know what they wanted. And the loose specifications document that, that was produced as a result was seen as a sort of vote of confidence in your team. Um, they believed in your team so much that they knew that whatever you deliver would just be exactly what they needed. And uh, that might have happened for you, this rare phenomenon, but the, the problem with proceeding with this loose specifications document is that it's a weak defense uh, when the client's ex expectations have not been met for you to say, well, uh, you didn't tell us, you know, you didn't explain it. Um, we, we, like as a developer, I would be dissatisfied if I was not involved in delivering applications that met a real business need. You know, it's not just about delivering something, it's about delivering quality. So, <clears throat> no team effort, um, no, in a team effort rather, uh, no individual sex success can compensate um, for the project failure, either completely or in a stage of development. Just as in a football team, there are different roles, you know, we might, um, the defense might have played a really good game, the goalkeeper, whatever, but if the team loses, then, then that sting of project failure is, is going to you know, it's going to be felt throughout, no matter how well an individual played. So let's set our roles aside for a second. What is it that we in the application world do? We deliver, all of us. You know, whatever we, specific piece of work that we do, we should all have our eye on the prize. We should all have a route to success. So what is it that we are delivering? Theodore Levitt said, people don't want a quarter-inch drill, they want a quarter-inch hole. As each member of the team understands what the real problem is and the real value in the application that we're developing, then we can begin to engender more quality in the work that we do. By the way, this is a principle that not only applies to software development, but in attaining any goal. We must communicate amongst all stakeholders what the value is in the work that we are doing. Ultimately, the complexity or the time intensity of the work that you've done will pale into insignificance when it, the work that you've done is considered to meet a real business need. They, of course, they're, they're going to pay you for that work, but they, they don't care that it took a long time. They don't care that it was really complex. If it meets a real business need, if you want to make your client happy, then meet that need. You know, yeah, work hard. That's part of it. Um, <coughs> In order for us uh, to ensure that we are solving the right problems, we need to create a framework to offer assurances to all stakeholders that we are on the right track. This is a good time to talk about Dan North. Dan North created the first ever behavior-driven development framework or BDD framework, and that was called JBehave, followed, followed by a story-level BDD framework uh, for Ruby called RBehave, which was later integrated into the R RSpec project and our spec was later replaced by the Cucumber project, which some, some of you may, may have heard of. Dan North's Introducing BDD article appeared in the March 2000 and, 2006 edition of Better Software magazine. The idea of behavior-driven development evolved as Dan articulated his response to many of the concerns that he, he was being faced with when encouraging development teams to approach their projects using test-driven development, they would ask, where do we begin testing? What do we test and what do we not test? How much do we test in one go? And what should we call our tests? And how do we understand why a test fails? I hope to cover some of these responses as we look at, at what BHAC can deliver to us as a BD, BDD framework. But I recommend that you all read this article and I'll put a link to it in the slides. Key to all of this is that we need to communicate more effectively in our teams what the acceptance criteria are for the work that lies ahead. We need a common language. One sure way of not meeting the client's needs is for the development team to have their own way of describing things. 
and they adopt a different language. If we cannot make the effort to adequately articulate the expected behavior of our application, then we should not be in the business of developing quality enterprise standard applications. We need a ubiquitous language that acts as a vehicle for our communication between different roles in the software project. Everything that we do should re revolve around a business, uh, uh, so a business value or user need. We have attended too many user story workshops where the focus of the meeting became more about convincing the client that we cared about the user than actually trying to draw out what the real problems were, what the real solutions that the user needed. If a feature being discussed does not deliver a benefit to a given user, then we should be in a position to challenge it. The process will help us to deliver not features, but business values. The document that comes out of such an exercise can then become a measure for delivery. Our work is done when the agreed business needs have been met. So a feature declaration should, should uh, contain a user, a benefit to that user, and a feature that delivers that benefit. Consider the feature declaration as a website user. I want a user registration form so that the site admins can have my information. There we have a benefit that we should feel inclined to challenge because we need to consider what the benefit is for the user that is encountering the feature. So this process is not only just about getting requirements, it's about challenging requirements and ensuring that what you do will bring real business value. Unfortunately, a feature declaration alone will not allow us to conf confidently deliver an acceptable product to our client. Our client will have or should be encouraged to develop expectations about the behavior of a given feature. In the case of a user registration form, they must visualize the process of filling out that form and what would happen when the form is submitted. Because if they don't do it at the beginning of the project, you can bet they're gonna do it when they actually test the thing. If our imagination is lacking in the planning stage, then it needs to be awakened because resource is expensive and our top developers are about to embark on solving the wrong problem. If we can adequately describe and document the various scenarios that our users will face when encountering this new or improved feature of our website, then we can find ourselves in a position where the client will say, if the feature behaves in the way that we have described here, then we consider this to be acceptable. So a story's behavior is, its, is simply its acceptance criteria. Given some initial context, when an event occurs, then ensure some outcomes. Let's take a look what a real example might look like. I've taken this example from the bhat.org tutorial and the feature in question is search. This is a perfect introduction to the Gherkin language which was encountered first with the Cucumber project. We can see here that we have a structure for how to lay out our, our, our feature declarations and the scenarios that describe the accept, expected behavior of this feature. This document is our high level acceptance test. This document could be, could be used by a tester to verify that the feature works as expected. Any testers in the room? Would you be happy with a document like that to accompany the user interface that you are about to test? You'd be clear on what was expected. So, so what are we delivering? We are delivering these clearly defined features that the client has deemed acceptable. Developers in the room, would you be happy with a document like the one we saw on the previous slide to direct your work on a given feature? I'm a developer and one of the first things that I concern myself with when I get a new project is what is it gonna feel like at the end? You know, are we gonna have a happy client at the end? And when I get a loose specifications document, that worries me because it's not clear to me what I need to do in order to make the client happy, in order to meet their expectations, in order to bring value uh, to them. We stop developing when the business value has been delivered. We may be tempted to deliver more than what is expected. This is a common trap with Drupal development, particularly with modules that do more than what you expect them to do. This might work out, but you may wish to tread lightly because any feature or behavior will need to be supported 
and that new beha behavior which was not documented might not work in quite the way that the client expects and cause you more pain than, than you imagined. When we achieve the accepted beha behavior of a feature, we know that we can confidently deliver. Oh, I'll just cover that slide, sorry. In order to deliver, we must test and test often. A few years ago, I was banned for driving for six months. It wasn't for excessive speeding, but it was for speeding on a number of occasions for accruing points. I ought to have verified my speed more frequently. <laughs> I have the tools available for me to stay within the speed limit. In order to avoid speeding, I must know the acceptable speed in the area that I'm in, and I must know what my current speed is. However frustrating it is to get a speeding ticket, imagine the struggle to stay within the speed limit if we did not have available to us the, the speed limit in the current area, and if our car was not fitted with a speedometer. As a developer, I should be interested in my ability to meet an acceptable level of quality when working on a particular feature. In fact, this might be a good time to mention unit tests. I want to make it clear that there is no conflict with the kind of tests that will cover the behavior of an application and the tests that will, that will ensure that the smallest components of our application that are maybe the unseen heroes of our application can and ought to be tested on a unit level. While unit tests can help to ensure that we build the right build the thing right, acceptance tests ensure that we build the right thing. I'm making a habit of this, aren't I? So yeah, this is the slide. <laughs> uh, these slides will be available later. <laughs> An acceptance test verifies that the feature works exactly the way the customer team expects it to. As mentioned, it ensures that we have built the, thing, the right thing. When an acceptance test passes, it indicates that the stakeholder will deem your work acceptable. This is when applications go live. This is when final invoices are paid. So let's mention BHAT. BHAT is a PHP framework for testing your business expectations. It is heavily inspired by the Ruby Cucumber project. And we owe a lot to this man, Konstantin Kudryashov, for his dedication in successfully porting this project to PHP and being such an advocate for BDD. Maybe before this presentation is through or immediately after, you can tell him on Twitter how excited you are about BHAT. The significance for us in the Drupal world is that this library is written in PHP, and many of us are quite confident programming in that language. So let's take a look at BHAT a little, a little closer. Feature declarations are written in the Gherkin language. These documents are passed by the BHAT script library. The behavior of the feature is simulated as the steps that have been written in the structured feature documents are used to trigger browser events or to report on, on what is returned in the browser. The result of the BHAT tests is a report telling you if the feature works as expected. The steps in each scenario are matched up with functions in a feature in a feature context object using um, annotations. On the screen, we see steps that are available in the mink context, which is a BHAT extension. This shows us how the human readable Gherkin language, what's that, sorry? Can you make the font any bigger? On this one, this, is, this here is a uh, screenshot, so I can't on this, I will on the demos. Okay, sorry. So this shows us how the human readable Gherkin language of our feature declarations and scenarios is mapped to a test that can be automated for us. The step given I am on forward slash user is passed and triggers the visit method and passes the forward slash user as a parameter to that function. It is easy to see why someone may have packaged together a bunch of step declarations that we encounter commonly with all web applications. We will find that for many of our applications, that many of the steps that we would call upon have actually been predefined in the MINK extension. So it is possible to cover much of the behavior of our applications without having to write much or any PHP code. Of course, we should 
We should challenge the language used in the steps. Even though the, the behavior of a step might match your requirements, if you do not believe that the human readable language is adequate, then I suggest that you go ahead and write the step in a language that means something to your team. And then write a PHP method in your BHAT uh, feature context that routes to that function, uh, which will trigger the expected behavior. Do not compromise on the language used. Again, sorry for this, the font there. Um, I, w I was excited to learn uh, that there is a Drupal extension available for BHAT that makes some additional steps available that may be considered common for Drupal sites and also that bridge some functional gaps that you would encounter on your own. Um, otherwise, sorry, uh, when you would be faced with the task of, of writing a function that determined that you were logged in on a Drupal site uh, or actually logged you in so that you could perform some tests for authenticated users. The efforts of those who have contributed to the Mink extension project and the Drupal, ex uh, so yeah, I just wanted to mention, so we've got Jonathan Hedstrom and Melissa Anderson to thank for actively working on that project on the Drupal extension. Um, and the efforts of those, of those two and, and, and others who have worked on the Drupal extension and those who have worked on the Mink extension uh, means that in some cases covering your web applications with BHAP tests will not require you, you to write a single line of PHP code because the steps available for these extensions may adequately cover the expected behavior of the features of your application. BHAT is an acceptance testing framework. With the MINK extension enabled, it becomes an acceptance testing framework for web applications. The browser is the window, window through which um, web users interact with web applications and, and other users. Users are always talking with web applications through the browser. In order to test that our web application behaves correctly, we need a way to simulate this interaction between browser and web application in our test. We need Mink to do this. Mink is a common gateway between our application and the browser. We still need a browser. If we want to test our applications in browsers that we're familiar with, then we need to use the Selenium or Sahi service which should be running on the machine at the time that the tests are run. The benefit of using actual browsers is that you can determine that the site work, it works as expected in, in browsers that are actually used in production. Um, and also these regular browsers support JavaScript inherently. For many of the tests, it may be fine to use a headless browser. And the default that ships with BHAT is sort of Goop, the Goop browser. Um, and we can benefit from the speed, speed gains involved for the scenario as a website user. When I visit the homepage, I should see five news articles. Unless that content is served up by Ajax, then it might be sufficient to uh, allow that to run in a headless browser. PhantomJS is a headless browser, um, which Sahi can interface with. I have been able to use this with good results. We can target specific scenarios to be tested in a JavaScript browser, while others can be run in a non-JavaScript headless browser. We do this by writing the tag at JavaScript above the appropriate scenarios. And in the config.yaml file, if we have listed which browser and driver to use for JavaScript, then it will run that test in the JavaScript browser. So now I'm gonna do a demo. Okay. Through the magic of 3G. Okay, so I've deliberately sort of honed around this, the tests that, um, the features that are written on the bhat.org website because I want everyone to come out of this sort of eager to learn, eager to do a bit more than you've already done. Um, some of you may be more experienced than me, but if you haven't used bhat before, please go on the bhat.org website and run through some of these kind of um, tutorials and you'll, ha you'll have a good experience with it. So... Um, the first thing that I wanted to sort of demonstrate is um, that we have a lot of step de declarations available to us. What's the font size like there? No? It's not good. Contrast is not good at all. Yeah. What can I do about that? Turn the light out. It's item if you go to preferences, you can change it to be black or white. That might be easier. Yeah. Yeah. Or can we do the lights, actually? Is that a possibility? I don't. 
Is that better? No? Come closer. Shall I go on? Or is it terrible? It's only going to be the prompts that are great. The rest of it should be OK to read. OK, let's go. OK, the first thing that I wanted to demo is the fact that like, when you get BHAC down, and we use Compo the Composer package managers to do that, and I'm not going to cover the install here. It's just too, it'll take too long, and we've got problems with the internet anyway. Um, but you install it, and then the first time you run BHAT, not much will happen. But if you, uh, um, there are, there's a, a parameter that you can kind of pass that um, that lists all of the steps that are available. Actually, you're seeing there what would be output with a mink uh, uh, context, but I'm going to just uh, revert back to using the BHAT context, which is what it ships with. And you'll see there it comes out with no step declaration. So you're going to want to extend the mink extension. So I'll go back and do that. Then you've got a bunch of sort of step declarations that will cover much of the behavior of a web, app web application. And you get even more with the Drupal extension. <coughs> so the first feature that we're going to sort of demonstrate and we'll, we'll, we're going to build on this one, is the, uh, just one scenario for a search feature. So we've declared our search feature here. We've uh, specified a benefit. We've specified the user. And we've specified the feature in a descriptive way, in a way that could mean something to every member of the team. And we've created a scenario, given I am on this page, when I fill in the search with behavior-driven development, and I, I press the search button, then I should see agile software development. And I'm going to run this in the uh, headless Goop browser. By default, it would actually go through all of the features, but I just want to target this uh, one feature. So I'm just going to use the tag that I've created for it called search01. And it's stepping through there. I'm just going to do this in it. 3G. Yay. So it's gone through. So two steps have passed. Could be a long day, eh? <laughs> How much time do we have? Because I forgot to start my time. OK. All right, so it passed. Um, we had one scenario there, and then four steps, uh, and it all passed in our headless browser. So I've just built up on that here, and um, I used a scenario, but we want to pass multiple so we want to do multiple tests around that scenario we're not going to accept that it works just because we put in behavior driven development and it returned what we expected we'll put a number of things in there um, and so what i've done here is um, i've got that example rather than in a scenario it's a scenario outline which acts as a template and it will consider this to be one scenario because we've only provided one input but we could add to that um, so we could add like um, when I type in clowns, I expect to see evil. Because you do, right? So let's run that. Again, this is in the Goot headless browser. This would uh, normally um, work much quicker. OK, so we had one set scenario outline, but two, that's considered to be two scenarios because we've run through it twice. They both passed, um, and there were eight steps that passed. So the next step, I'm, I'm running that one again. And actually, because of the speed, I'm actually going to remove the first. We know that that kind of works correctly. But I just wanted to introduce a second uh, scenario. So we're covering uh, what searching for a page that does exist. And now we're going to search for a page that does not exist. Um, and we're just using the scenario rather than the scenario outline. Uh, so.
Um, after this one, I'll probably just, uh, rather than running all of them, I'll target a couple um, so we can just see some, some of the other aspects of this. Had this have been running quicker, I would have liked to have taken you about sort of 10 different ones. Um, So we ran through the first one, which was uh, searching for a page, uh, so expecting that the page would return a result. Um, and then the other one is expecting that the page would not return a result, given a search, search term was added. And both of those passed. So we're building up you know, our sort of library here. Um, and here I've got a scenario outline, just as before. And uh, I'm going to remove this one entirely just so that it will run a bit quicker for us. Um, and here I've converted this to a scenario outline. And just so that, that you can see this actually working in a real browser, um, I've tagged it with that JavaScript. We don't need JavaScript to, to run this, um, but uh, we'll see it happening. So um, the bhat.yaml file, which contains the default configuration for this, just contains uh, the path for where I want uh, my feature context to live and also what the URL is that I'm targeting. So if you were targeting the dev URL, then you would probably have a separate bhat.yaml or there are other ways to do it, which would specify the, the dev URL rather than the, produ the production one. And I've also specified that we're going to use Goot as well. But for the, uh, to test it in Chrome, I've um, asked it to use Sahi to generate the JavaScript session and to use the Chrome uh, browser. Uh, Sahi, uh, when you install it, it's by default, it's ready to go with Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, I believe. Uh, I've also added support for Phantom JS. Not me added support, but I en enabled it. Um, there's plenty of tutorials that are available online to help you to do that. So I'm actually going to specify that we use that YAML file. Ah. Start side. So it's loading up the page. This actually might, uh, this will work because it doesn't require JavaScript. We may struggle to demonstrate the JavaScript stuff because I have it die after a certain amount of time. <laughs> yeah, which is reasonable, yeah. We still is the internet still down? So it's typed in fish, and in England we eat fish and chips. So that should be expected. And I'll break out after this one. I think I had two um, going. So it's looking on the results page. Ah, command execute, limited. Um, I haven't seen that before, but the first one ran through successfully anyway, so I'm happy enough to move on on that one. Um, so on the next one, um, obviously that didn't require JavaScript to do that. I just wanted to demo it coming through on Chrome. Um, now, the next step that we want to do is um, we want to test the autocomplete functionality. Um, so when we're searching for a page with autocomplete, when we fill in the search with a given term and you wait a designated amount, amount of time, 
30 seconds, should I increase that? <laughs> 60 seconds, <laughs> then I should see behavior-driven development. But there, uh, you know what, like if we don't get to see this, that, it'd be a shame, but um, I'm, there is a, a step here that I want to introduce, so it's going to fail anyway. <laughs> um, and I'm going to just remove this for now, just to show you what I hope to demo here. So this is, uh, I'm not going to use the um, JavaScript browser here, just going to use the Goop browser. Still slow, isn't it? But um, it's going to break basically on the step that says, and I want, and I wait a number of seconds. That step doesn't exist yet. And it'll prompt us to add that as a step in our feature context. It's even going to give us the code to inject into the feature context as well, so we can just copy and paste it in. Um, there are, there's also a parameter that you can pass called um, append, uh, append snippets, which will actually inject it into the feature context directly uh, for you, so you don't even need to copy and paste. And when I saw that first time, I thought, man, whoever implemented that has way more time than I have. <laughs> But I feel that about a lot of these projects as well. I feel, you know, in awe of the, the people that contribute these tools because they have put a lot of work in at their own cost and time, and, and we do appreciate that. Um, so this, this is uh, timing out all over the place because of the 3G. Um, but um, needless to say, the, we're encouraged to use the step de declarations that are available to us in the Mint context, and we've got the Drupal context available to us, but we can add additional um, steps. So if I go to the feature context, it's quite bare at the moment. I've, I've added this, I'll explain that one in, in a second, but here we've got um, like uh, just a, an example script that, that we could use to create our own step. And I'm going to create a step that would have been useful for us if we wanted to wait a designated amount of time. All you sub sublime gurus are probably thinking, what the heck is he doing right now? <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the test that we wanted to run is the step that we wanted to run, rather, I'll just, just jump straight ahead for this one, So, and I, and I wait for the suggestion box to appear, because the first one was, and I wait a designated amount of time, so it was, and I wait three seconds. And the cool thing that it would, would have done as well, it would have generated an example method, but it would have also detected that the, there was an integer in that string, and it would have replaced that integer with a brackets uh, back, uh, backslash uh, D plus, um, so that it can actually pass the integer as a parameter to that function so that it makes it just more useful for when you, you, you want to use the same step to just uh, designate different, to wait for different amounts of time. Now, what it was decided um, on this step declaration is that it didn't, it wasn't really using language that meant something to the team. We don't wait a designated amount of time. We wait for the suggestion box to appear so we've changed the language here to say, and I wait for the suggestion box to appear. And um, go to the feature context, given uh, oh, It is some <laughs> Yeah, something to that effect. And then it'll, it'll suggest that we write off methods in a way that resembles the, the language of the step. So it'll be something like this suggestion box to appear. Uh, that doesn't need a parameter. And then uh, the command that we would, the uh, code that would allow us to wait that amount of time is something to this effect. So that the next time it was run, that step would 
it would come across that step, it would match it up with the annotation uh, that existed in, that, in the feature context. It would run that function, and then it would either wait five seconds, which I've designated as a timeout time, or it would um, stop when the suggestion results um, box appeared. And that can save us a bit of time on the JavaScript browser as well. And it also just enables it to work. Uh, it, it covers the expected behavior because that's what our, our users would expect to happen. So again, here I've got a scenario outline that, that we would have used in that instance. And it's waiting for the su suggestion box to appear and we can just supply different results. And if I'd have run this in the Chrome browser, we would have seen it fill in the results, the suggestion box appear, it would verify that it's that the uh, suggestion uh, is there and then it would pass it and then it would just run through them all and say that all your tests had passed. Um, another thing that um, I could have demoed as well is that um, on a failure, it might be useful to sort of trigger an event. Um, the other day on Twitter, I saw that somebody had integrated it with Mantis uh, which was their sort of issue queue um, platform and uh, on a fail it would create an issue uh, to notify the the appropriate team member to do that and you can attach a screenshot as well. Um, PhantomJS um, allows you to write sort of scripts that can be run um, and uh, there's this um, in my feature context here this after step run function gets run at the end of a step and I'm just saying here if the browser name is phantom.js and the event, just bring this in, and the event get result is step event failed, then execute a script and that script um, takes a screenshot and it saves it into an, uh, a designated folder and puts a date stamp on it. So you can trigger other, other events around there. Now there are a lot of, uh, the cool thing about BHAT is it's just a script library at the end of the day. You can, um, you can inject it into your code base so it can be part of, you've got your doc root and then you've got your BHAT tests. Um, and a lot of people have made BHAT tests that cover sites that we're aware of like uh, Drupal.org or Commerce Kickstart. Um, and, and you can just download them and run them on a site that's already up there. Um, and the, this, uh, there was a, the B uh, test for Commerce Kickstart have been put together by Graham Taylor. I think it's sort of a work in progress, but it's just a proof of concept. Uh, so you can uh, Commerce Kickstart, install it on your machine, and then run these tests that, that are written, written up in these features. <coughs> how, how much time have we got, sorry? Okay. Right, so I apologize that about the internet. I would have liked to have um, sh shown you some flashy demos and, and stuff, but I hope that the value in what um, we did see some demos, we saw JavaScript working, um, and I would have liked, I've got Commerce Kickstart installed, and I should have um, really thought ahead that the internet might die. <laughs> it's, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now that we've seen a demo, I hope that you can see that this is something that you could easily incorporate into your projects. I hope you can take something away from this presentation, whatever your experience of, of applying user stories, developing acceptance tests, or using BHAT itself. If you, if you have never installed BHAT, please, over the next few days, install it and have a play. If you've used BHAT before, maybe you, you've been prompted to use it in a different way. Or maybe you were fa fairly familiar with BHAT, but you were struggling to communicate to all the stakeholders the value in behavior-driven development. And I hope maybe that I've helped you to articulate a little better the value in using BHAT to protect a project from failure and to assist you in delivering business values. So this is a tool for those who care about quality. It's for those who care about delivery, and it's a structured approach to delivering quality. For me, the ultimate expression of automated acceptance testing is in aiding continuous integration and continuous deployment. This might be considered the crucial measure that our latest commit has not compromised the integrity of our application in its ability to behave as expected. Having the application covered with automated acceptance tests 
makes it easier uh, to confidently deploy a fix or feature enhancement to a site. I'm not going to talk about the merits and challenges of continuous deployment, but for those who would hope to be in a position to introduce automation through the release process, can you envisage a scenario where you introduce a fix to a website and commit the code into the appropriate Git branch? The simple act of committing that code could trigger a chain of events that could deploy a clone of your production site in code, files, database, and environment. Your new code could be introduced and a few Drush commands automatically run to trigger the pending update hooks and clear cache. Because you have BHAT tests in the Git repo, you should trigger those, those tests and simulate the behavior of the whole site and determine whether everything works as expected. A successful run of the BHAT tests could trigger a Git tag being created and deployment being scheduled to the production environment. If the BHAT test fails, then we could automatically generate a screenshot of the interface at the point of failure and advise the interested parties that an unexpected failure had occurred. For each release of our application, we should only have the tests in the code that cover the behavior of the application in its current state and not the tests that cover the behavior of features yet to be developed. Integration is often very painful it's a painful process. If this is true on your project, integrate every time somebody checks in and do it from the start of the project. If testing is a painful process that occurs just before release, don't do it at the end. Instead, do it continually from the beginning of the project. If releasing software is painful, aim to release it every time somebody checks in a change that passes all the automated tests. Reaching a level of acceptance tests that can be considered a benchmark for quality would open the, up the door to such a possibility. Whatever the challenges are for implementing continuous delivery, one thing is for sure, we could not do it without automating our acceptance tests, and BHAT helps us to do that. In closing, I want to say something about the word acceptance or acceptable. I used it in my session title, and we encounter it most commonly in the phase of project delivery called user acceptance testing. Maybe when you started out in this business, you hoped to do more than acceptable work. Maybe when you started, uh, sorry, you hoped you would be involved in delivering exceptional work. Let me say this, in order to exceed a client's expectations, you must first pass the post of achieving their expectations. Giving a client what they expect is not to be underestimated. The expected behavior of a set of features designed to meet the real business needs of the users of an application is the foundation of exceptional work. Thank you. I invite any questions. Um, if you do have a question um, or comment, please come to the mic. Um, and I, I, I do really want your comments as well. If there's something that you've been itching for me to say, you know, you've been using BHAT in a cool way, then please come up and, and tell us about it. Um, do you mind coming up to the mic? Is that okay? Because then we can get it on the tape. It's just in the middle of the, middle of the room. Um. The practice of actually sitting down with your client and writing your specification in this format. What are the tools for actually getting the things written? You know, you can sit down there and end up with pages and pages of, of these docs, but what are you trying to do when you sit down with a client and write up the specification in this BDD language? Is that, because that is part of your mission, isn't it? Your spec is your test. Yeah, well it's important, first of all, that whatever we produce is considered to be the definition, you know. So what we want to get away from is um, having, you know, this is the best we could do in this meeting, and then have it translated, um, you know, and then we'll all we'll write the proper spec specifications document at a later time, because uh, you'll lose some of the value of the application. Um, so well, <laughs> people are worried that um, the 
these uh, meetings that you have with the client to draw out all of the scenarios that might cover the accepted behavior would be long and laborious. Um, but we only need to get to the point where, as I said in, in, in the presentation, if, if it works as documented in this document, and, and we've got the facility here of the Gherkin language, so, so we can use that as a structure. And I believe that there are plugins either being worked on or available for various text editors. Um, if, if it works as described here, then it's acceptable, and you need to get sign off on that. Yeah, does that sort of answer it? Yeah, it's just, it's just a matter of how easy is it to sit with your client in a meeting and write these things in a way that is useful so you don't rewrite them again. So. It's it, e easier than handing the fallout of not doing it. Yeah. Thanks. I think there is a, there's a Jura, a Jura extension that you can write these stories and then they'll be automated. So Simon said there that there is a Jira extension which allows you to put um, the tests in Jira and that's true. Um, I know some people that are doing it. I've not impl implemented it myself, so you can actually put uh, them in Jira, and it will um, you enable the Jira extension, and actually uh, sort of use the APIs and get the tests from Jira, and that can be helpful as well. But I think it's important that they're also in code as well, so that we've got you can just check out the code and know what tests to run for that code, because you might want to roll back or something like that. Yeah, I have a question as well. I am kind of new to this, maybe a stupid question, but um, suppose you have a test and it it changes your data some way um, and you have a lot of tests, how do you prevent that the change of the data in test A um, has an influence on another test? Um, yeah, um, it, ideally every test, every scenario should be used in isolation and there's a, there's different ways of doing it, but I think with the Drupal API extension, so I was using the Drush extension, or I would have been using the Drush extension to log into a site and perform a test as an automated user. And is uh, rightly, it's making changes to the database, but cleanup could be done after every test um, so that it's uh, as it, so that you could target that test and no other test would impact upon it. So you just, after the test you, Delete, delete the user yeah. if you've created a user. So you may create a dummy uh, user to run that test. Delete the content. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. That would be the, the desired effect. Yeah. Can you maybe comment on that one? Uh -huh. uh, what we did is we created a tag which was destructive test. So anything okay. which was we classed as destructive, it wouldn't get run on live. So if we made a deployment that created, um, like, so I had a test that created some new content to see that it was worked. When we came, we'd run that on a dev environment, but we never sort of went live with that. And then we had a cleanup thing as well. But yeah, that's a really useful thing. I'm going to repeat that because it wasn't on the mic. So he was saying there that he um, was able to identify um, tests that would be destructive and that you would never want to run on live. Some tests you're willing to run on live. So uh, rightly so, you can tag those, those tests, those scenarios. And just as I tagged, um, I, I was running just a specific tag. If you, rather than using the ampersand, you use the Tyndall, uh, you can say um, run everything except. Um, and so that's what you've been doing there, and he's found that useful. Um, so with, uh, well, uh, behavior tests, you're really testing more the, the user interface, so the thing that you can actually explain to the client, and then you have unit tests which are really technical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are some tests which are really, so integration tests, acceptance tests, but are really something that only your developers will understand. So you want to test some edge case. How do you really integrate those? Do you put them in, in some, I want to test crazy edge case, and then you actually implement that, or? There's probably, a, a a multitude of answers for that because it would depend upon circumstances. It may be that if you cannot uh, describe it in a way that actually aligns it with some business value, then then maybe there's a missed opportunity there and you could uh, go back to the drawing board a little bit because uh, it's sort of well documented that if you actually tie everything around a user need that, that you can sort of, it's a process of creation, of innovation. and um, but. Um, people are using BHAT in different ways. Uh, the BHAT itself, without the MINK extension, it's an acceptance testing framework. But and people are using it for unit tests, functional tests, and uh, so if it helps, use it. Yeah. Okay. I think the key message here, and I think that w what I really like about the guys who have written BHAT is 
they're saying the, the right things. Um, initially, when Constantine um, uh, began writing the BHAT tool, he didn't envisage using it in the ways that it's being used. And the first time that I saw him present on it was at Symphony Live um, London last year. And uh, then I saw him again in Manchester. Um, and he didn't do a demo at all. And I was like, um, if I'd have known ahead of time that he wasn't going to show us his mad Vim skills, then I would have been disappointed. <laughs> Because um, in London, he was doing it in front of your eyes, sort of like inputting stuff, like tests, doing tests and then, and then um, not doing any development until there's a test to, to cover it. But what he talked about is its ability to assist you in delivering quality and ensuring that that agile process is protected. And, and this is the message that we need. Testing is important, but what we've struggled with is selling it to every member of the team this isn't just about testing, it's about delivering what the client needs. Thank you. <laughs>